Welcome to the Chaos Communication Congress in 2005. <laughs> so, um, welcome everybody. Very glad you're here. Um, I'm just giving a short introduction to the Congress, to our facilities, what we have here, what's in store. I'm going to talk about who we are and what we are not. Um, dive just a bit into the Congress history, not too much. Explain the facilities we've set up this year. We tried hard to improve on, on the last year. And uh, I'm going to dive a bit into the conference program. I'm not going to explain all the talks because it's just far too much. We got 150 talks this year. And, well, I'll show you where you can look for that. I'm also going to point to a couple of projects, although this list is extensive and I'm not being able, I'm not able to, to cover everything like this. And then I will hand over to the keynote speech, which should be the center of this opening. So, <clears throat> you are here hosted by the Chaos Computer Club. And as you might know, CCC is pretty old organization, and we've been here for a long time. This is the 22nd Chaos Communication Congress, and I just saw a video of the second Congress in 1985, and if you compare that to what we have now, well, we came a long way. And still, we are fighting for the same thing. It's still the hacker image in the public that's somehow distorted, so I think uh, it's pretty necessary to always reiterate on what we are and what we are not. And I'm starting what we are not. And we are not criminals. Keep that in mind. Hacking is about freedom, and hacking is about achieving things and understanding the world outside, which is more and more filled with technology. And if you don't understand the technology, you don't understand your world, and if you don't understand your world, you're fucked. <laughs> so we're not criminals. But we're also not the almighty uber geeks. Yeah? Although some people probably think we are. And we can get into everything and opening bank accounts or whatever. But that's not the point. It's more, if somebody really wants to explore, if somebody really wants to get into things, then he's probably a hacker. And that's enough. You don't have to be number one in every respect, but it's also uh, it's always important that you want to get into things, want to understand how it works. And if you do that, then you're a hacker, and then you are definitely at the right place here. And we are not <laughs> fixing your Windows box. And we are not to be ignored. Hackers have a voice, and we're going to show this here in the next four days. I'm pretty sure about this. So what we are. We are concerned. Hackers are a group of people who think about how the world works and how it should, should work probably in a better way. I'm not saying we have a solution for everything, but at least we're thinking about this, and that's important. And we are totally committed to do this. This scene lasts for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And in this video I mentioned, somebody asked, one of these press guys asked, well, in the future, is this going to stay the same? Are you still going to put the same pressure on these issues? Wow answered and said, yes, I don't see any reason why not. And that's just the case. That's good. And we're furious. We really mean it. We're really concerned about these things, and we have to push hard, and that's what's being done here at the Congress. And we're not holding still. And we're pretty darn serious about it. So, 22nd Chaos Communication Congress. It started in Hamburg in 1984 with a reason, because this is the Ovalian year, and it was sort of the, the icon, the symbol of surveillance, um, oppression, and everything. Funny enough, 
this year is more or less the time that even in Germany we get all these laws and rules that we thought would probably already exist 1984. It took some time. But these issues are coming up again and again. So in 1984, this whole event was a very, very small, very small island of, of people who knew or had an idea that computers are going to have a really important impact on society. And as you can see, we later on moved to Berlin. And today, this event grew to uh, a fascinating event. It was two days when it started. Now it's the first year we have opened uh, the fourth day because we felt it was very important to give enough time to meet and give enough time to talk about these issues. <clears throat> so, what can you expect from the Congress this year? I'm going to talk about where you can get information from, um, who you should contact if you're a speaker, where you can get your telephone services, and your network <laughs> services, of course. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> and, of course, where you can get medical help if you need it. So, first of all, there's the infodex, infodesk. You find it at the ground floor at B01. Um, that's the place where you should ask first. Whenever you don't really know who to ask, go to the info desk, they might know it. At least they can point you to the right person to ask. That's pretty important. They got lists of hotels, they got maps, they got schedules, they got everything. And if they don't, they will, uh, they will try. And you can also get the proceedings there. And if you want to um, stay in, uh, in the gym, um, you can go to the entrance and, and get your ticket there. If you're a speaker, head over to the conference room, which is down there, on the left side. Um, B03, that's the point. And that's your first stop as a speaker. You get all the support you need, and please make sure that you check in there first, because we want to know that you're there and want to make sure that you have everything you need. Um, you can also use the speaker room to make dates for interviews and such. Uh, this is also important for other people. It's not the info desk. Only go there if you really have something that's um, related to being a speaker. One of the more important facilities is the POC, the Phone Operation Center. You might already have known about this, heard about this. You can get your DECT handset and uh, go to the registration there, and then you have a phone book, your free dial in, your free dial out as well over the internet totally modern. And uh, you can also listen to lectures on the phone. So in case you're missing something because you're stuck in a talk somewhere, you can use your telephone. And if you don't have one, get one. Over there is uh, a supermarket electronic store. You can get there and I heard you can return it if you don't like it. Also important, the Network Operations Center. These guys have done an incredible job this year. You all know that there have been issues with networking from Congress to Congress, and that's because it's not an easy task to provide a well-running network for such a large crowd of people where 80% is always trying to get around anything. So uh, there's a wired and a wireless network, and from what I know, it's working since yesterday, and it's working well so far, which is really cool. In case you have a network question, there's a uh, Network Operation Center help desk at the ground floor and at, uh, at the basement as well. All network-related questions should go there. And if you've got a server you want to host, ask them. They might be able uh, to help. And please stay calm at all times. It's very important. Medical help is provided by the CERT, the Chaos Emergency Response Team, which you find at the ground floor on the right. Um, they got their room there. So that's the place for first aid, first responders. You get uh, medical assistance there if you need it, and maybe you even need psychological assistance. I don't know. Um, 
If you need anything, if you are needed in anything, you know, ask them, go there, maybe go there before you might need it um, in case of trouble. I said it. Just below this main hall here is the art and beauty area. That's our place for food, drinks, music, visuals, other funny projects. Um, you find the blinking area there with the uh, funny blinking projects, mechatronics, uh, the small size robotics. Um, there's a lock picking lounge, there's a go lounge that you can enjoy, and the crew of Visual Berlin is doing the visuals and is doing music as well for your pleasure. And below that is the Hack Center, the whole basement. There are quite a few projects to check out, I can't name them all. You can uh, look at the wiki, for instance. Um, there's an extra lounge area. This time, um, I hope this uh, will be well received. There's also an open workshop area, which I, uh, I'm going to mention later on. And uh, of course, beware of all the cabling and the evil hacksaws. So where can you get information from? Online, from the public wiki, that's the most important point. Everything is there. And what's not there is probably mentioned here. The events weblog will be filled during uh, the Congress as well, and we are using this to point you to very important stuff. So keep subscribed to this events web weblog, and keep subscribed to it even after the Congress, because we're going to use this outlet for all the un other upcoming events of the Chaos Computer Club in the coming time. Of course, there's the FAR plan, our schedule, also online. We had some changes to the FAR plan already. Um, one speaker couldn't come. Uh, there was a ch slight change. So just make sure that that, that is actually what you uh, think it is from uh, looking at the booklet. It's 95% okay. And the changes are not dramatic, but just make sure you've seen that. There's also an RSC back channel system. So for every talk, there's an on online channel, RSC Congress CCCDE. If you are logged in there, you can always see what's coming up. So you have an automatic notification of upcoming events. And um, you can also talk. So there's one channel per room, and you can just talk to other people about the talk. Also, there's the OSR community over there, showing their wireless stuff. Wikipedia has joined us again uh, over there. The Valand Foundation you find in the basement. There's the BSD communities around, and a lot more. I couldn't name them all. Check out the wiki, as I said. One word about angels. Please keep in mind, this is still a volunteer-driven event. I know we have raised the prices because we had to, but this would cost a lot, a lot, a lot more if we wouldn't have the support of a huge number of volunteers. And what's most important is the, the work of the Chaos Angels, all the volunteers that actually help out here uh, at the event itself, not only the volunteer effort that's being put inside. Yeah, and show, please show the, the, the politeness you expect to receive from everybody because that's the only way uh, it works. And also, you could be one. We are still looking for people to help out. Um, there's the, the angel room in the basement, and there's also another volunteer meeting if you want to uh, help us with announcing talks. We still have some uh, slots to fill there. Uh, there's a meeting. Oh, it's, not, uh, it's actually not room two. It's, it's the speaker room. Sorry, it's a mistake. Okay, regarding the conference program, this time we have four lecture rooms. Last year we had six, and we had to reduce that because it was just getting out of hand. We had too many people in the rooms. I'm still sure that everything's going to be crowded, so don't complain. There's just no other way. I mean, this building has its size, and we can't expand it uh, on demand, unfortunately. Everything starts at 11, so we shifted everything a bit, um, one hour to, um, well, accommodate for the usual sleeping practices. But we have included two breaks this time uh, in order to give you more room to meet with people and, and have a break from the conference talks. And 
keep your phones off during the talks, please. Um, yeah, there will be some additional, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> there will be some entertainment program here in the night as well. So if you want to just see a movie or something like this. Yeah, and I also mentioned it. We got the proceedings. I don't know, has anybody got the book in his hand right now? No, the, the proceedings, the big one. That is this big, big black book. It contains all the, pa the papers um, that we received. Um, go and get one. There's also two kinds of special events that we didn't plan ourselves, the lightning talks and the open workshops. Lightning talks uh, start every day at, at 4 p.m. And uh, that's just an open thing, nine talks each five minutes. If you still have something to say, there are slots available. You can just put it into the wiki and you're done. Uh, the third day, we've left open the third day until today, so now registration is open for the third day as well. If you have a good, uh, good idea what you want to talk about, go get to the wiki and get your slot. There's the, also the open workshop area at the Hack Center. Same thing, there are open slots if you want to do a workshop, one hour, two hour, no problems. There's this free table space you can just use. Go ahead and be the first one in the wiki. Okay, some recommendations on how to behave. Please, no smoking inside the building. We had a huge problem with smoking last year and we had long discussions about this. And we're just going to try it. We're uh, not pushing this hard, but just think about it twice, go outside and have your smoke outside. I think this will be good for everybody. Yeah, even more important, take care of the building, please. This is, every year we have huge costs, and I mean lots of money, many, many thousand euros, just because things break. People don't care about doors, they run through doors, the doors break, and it's another 500 euros. And so think twice and try to behave at least a bit, because uh, this is what, what really makes this, this event much more expensive than it needs to be. So please think about things. Don't put stickers on it, uh, on the walls and so on. That's really a problem. And of course, be friendly at all times and be helpful to others. That's the way how we can deal with any situations here. And in general, show what hackers can contribute. There are really lots of people coming here to the Congress who are not part of the scene, who are just interested in what we're doing. And I think we just give them the best picture we can get of what hacking is about and what the scene is about. <clears throat> now I really need to look <laughs> furious. Digital incidents, oh yes, we had them, especially last year. You might have heard about it. <sighs> And our reaction usually is, oh no, not again, <laughs> you know. So if you are exploring and if you really think you have to do something, keep in mind that this can really be very, very nasty for us and it can be really nasty for you as well. So if you're out there hacking, please switch on your brain before you switch on your computer. Just <laughs> do it. The Congress is just not the place to uh, explore all kinds of, of well, it's probably the place for exploring hacking practices, but do it on the test bed, do it on your machine, do it on any other machine that's provided by others just to do that. But just don't, you know, just don't. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it causes so much trouble for us as well. Last year we had just one day, the organization was just busy one day dealing with that. There are really other things we have to do here. And also keep in mind that we can't stop the authorities to use their authority. Yeah? They're having an eye and uh, we can't stop them from doing so. But just in case something is going to happen, we have opened the Hacker Ethics Hotline. So, questions like, what happens if I own that box now? 
is it morally justifiable to do this or that or whatever? Yeah. If these are things that come to your mind for I don't know which reason, yeah. And if you really want to know how much trouble this can actually cause just by hitting this one key. It's just one key, yeah. And if you don't really know what the trouble is, call the hotline. They will answer, they know, and they can tell you what's the best way to deal with all this kind of information. And it's very easy to reach. It's 1042. Keep that number in mind. 24 hour service. It's free. <laughs> and it's as anonymous as you want it to be. So use it, please. Thanks. So uh, in four days, everything will be over. Just a glimpse on what's coming. We're going to shut down the event on the 30th of December after the final event. Uh, the hack center must be completely dismantled at 10. Uh, please take all your stuff with you. Just look around. There are so many jackets, so many things. You can't really imagine what people are leaving at this, uh, you know. It's amazing. Uh, there's going to be some kind of lost and found service by us, but only in January. So if you lost something and you miss it, try to contact us as, as early as possible, because otherwise we're not really able to keep all this stuff around. And we're probably going to donate it or, or make use uh, of it. Um, there's going to be an after-hour party at the sea base, which is not very far away from here. So at the last day, if you still want to stay in Berlin, if you still want to stay with us, this after-hour party is for you. So thank you. Thank you for, for your interest and, and your support. Thanks to the speakers for the lectures. And of course, we're also thanking everybody who's given us financial, logistical support and also uh, hardware support, especially the networking is backed by quite a few companies that have uh, stepped in and given us that. And thanks for everybody who's promoting this event, writing about it in, in weblogs and the press, this is really helpful to get the work out. And of course, thanks to you for coming and of course for coming back. And there's one more thing, we've got a keynote. And we were thinking really hard about who we want to have uh, so many bright people outside, so we made a list of what we wanted. So we were looking for a keynote speaker that really fits our program. So we made a list of qualifications that should be met, and we thought what would be cool was must be able to run a nightclub. <laughs> if you've ever run a nightclub, you know, that's really hard stuff. If you can deal with a nightclub, you can deal with a lot of things. Also, you should have experience being a disc jockey, which makes you really relaxed. And uh, of course, university dropouts, <laughs> totally preferred. <laughs> <clears throat> and of course, should be a really nice guy. And what should I tell you? We found one. And he got extra qualifications as well. He is chairman of Technorati, which is a web weblog search engine, which you should check out if you don't know it yet. He's also chairman of Six Apart, which is uh, a weblog hosting and software producing software, doing the movable type stuff. Uh, he's also a board member of Creative Commons International. He's a board member of ICANN. He is also a board member of the Open Source Initiative. And he's also a board member of the Mozilla Foundation. I'm really happy to welcome Joy Ito with his talk, Private Investigations, for our keynote. Thank you very much. <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I was here last year, and I begged Tim to let me come back but I didn't have any special hacker qualifications, so he gave me the keynote, I think. Um, <laughs> and I, actually, there was one mistake that I didn't catch, but on the slides for Technorati and Six Apart, I'm head of Japan and an investor in the United States. Um, so I was reading the program and looking through all the things and thinking about um, what I was gonna say today. And uh, 
Tim's slide about we're furious and we're really serious is actually really important. You know, I like to try to make the talk very fun. Last year with Creative Commons, I showed funny videos and stuff like that. I warn you, it's not going to be that fun because the topic this year is qu actually quite serious and it's a, actually quite a serious time. And a lot of the, the talks throughout the, the days will have a lot of detail on a lot of the things that I talk about. And I really urge you to think about what you can do and how you can participate when you attend these talks. Um, and if I can reach. <clears throat> and I know there's a back channel for IRC. I don't have a network connected here, but this is a, a, a thing that we're doing. It's an open source project called Synchro Edit. It lets you kind of in real time edit a document together. Um, it's very, very buggy. And if you want to crash it, it's really easy. It's not a challenge. Please don't try. But, <laughs> but basically, there is an outline of my talk and things that you can, you can contribute to the page. And so if you have any ideas, any thoughts, any comments, please contribute to that page. I'll try to get back to you. I'll probably put it into a blog post at some time. Um, and any thoughts on the software would be great, too. So first of all, I think that I would like to start out by talking a little bit about why we're here. And one of the really important things, I don't know, I was looking at 1984 and thinking 1984, I had an X25 account and had to pay for it. I couldn't connect my modem to the phone line um, unless it was approved by the telephone company. Um, I had a token ring card. You know, I had all these things that required permission to hack that was regulated and everything was run by big um, computer companies and telephone monopolies. And back then, the only search engines we had was the address book and dialog databases. Okay? So everything happened in the center of the network. Nothing happened on the edge. The network was closed. And since then, the network has become more and more open at every layer. And the places that are standing in our way right now are the big monopolies. So it's the uh, Microsoft, some of the telephone companies still have some power, and others. But generally, the network has become op more and more open. But I think that there is a huge risk that the network will get closed again. The worst case scenario that I see for this open network is that within several years, the internet will be run by the ITU, Microsoft will have a trusted network that you have to access, and the telephone companies and the cable TV networks will join together and make the internet look like a cross between telephone and cable TV. And this is a real risk. And so I also think that the open internet is probably the center of democracy in the 21st century. Because I think that the revolutions that we used to have in the past were fought with pitchforks and guns. But today, revolutions happen through information. We see this in terrorism, we see this in developing nations, and without open access and voices for information, you can't cause change in the future. And the only way to allow a bottom-up and edge-driven process is to preserve the open network. I think the open network is more um, important for democracy than the right to bear arms or the right to vote. That's my opinion. <laughs> and, and by the way, I, this morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, I rewrote all my slides. Instead of saying topics, I decided to take a position. I have a passionate position on each of these issues, but I'm also very open-minded. So you can catch me in the hall or talk on my blog and try to convince me if you think something I said is wrong, because sometimes I am. Um, so first of all, I think I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I think I'm preaching to the choir, but one thing we have to remember is that democracy is quite broken. It's broken, but like I'll talk about this with ICANN as well, it's broken, but it doesn't mean that there is something better. And I think that one of the things we have to think about is how can we change, how can we fix and deal with the current democracy. I know that uh, uh, Frank and Rob are going to have this session at 7 o'clock today, which is a bit more pessimistic than mine maybe, but they touch on this issue quite a bit. And I'm not going to go into the details. There's many different kinds of democracies, but I'll highlight some of the aspects of democracy that I think are very important and that we need to preserve. Um, and I can give you some examples of why I think democracy is broken, but I won't do it right now. One of the really key things about democracy in an information society is the competition of ideas. This is the way that things get decided. And competition of ideas requires free speech. It requires the ability to say what you want to say, to say your opinion, to question authority without fear of retribution. Right? When you are in Zimbabwe, if you have more than five people together talking about something, you can be arrested and thrown in jail. If you are a blogger in Iran, 
you're more li most likely that if you speak up, you will get thrown in jail and your, your family will get thrown in jail. And in these places, they do not have the ability to say what they mean without fear of retribution. And although things are getting pretty bad, we can still stand here and question authority. And so we have it better than many, many democracies. But this is one of the key things that we have to preserve because it's the competition of ideas that allows change. And I'm quite optimistic about democracy in a way because I think that if you win the argument, you can change things. And people can disagree with me on that, but I think the most important thing is to have an argument and to be able to win and allow the good ideas to come up. One of the bad ideas which people keep talking about is free markets. People always kind of say, well, if we just made free markets, we made open markets. I think that a lot of the people who are anti-globalization haven't focused on the key points about what's dangerous about globalization. One of the dangerous things about globalization is free markets sounds like a good idea. But the problem is free markets allow monopolies to exist, right? And traditionally, or not traditionally, the government is supposed to keep the monopolies in check. There are supposed to be uh, fair trade commissions. There are supposed to be many ways to dismantle monopolies. Well, they don't work anymore. If you look at all of the big democracies in the world, they're controlled by lobbies that are controlled by monopolies and power aggregates. And one of the problems is that when we designed the democracies early on, like the American Republican democracy or like some of the direct democracies, we didn't anticipate how much power that a monopoly could get in the information age and how big they could get. And we didn't anticipate that companies would, would take the personalities of individuals. And so we don't have a very good design to deal with monopolies. But they can and have been flipped over in the past, but the current monopolies are getting stronger and stronger. And so one of the things you have to focus on is the fact that the free market doesn't help you with monopolies. I'm a proponent of the free market, but the monopoly is just the anomaly that you have to think about a lot. Um, the other important thing, which is very obvious, but something that you have to talk about, and since we're talking about privacy, is that the correct balance is transparency of those who have authority and privacy of citizens. The problem is that the natural tendency, the law of physics of power is that people in power want secrecy and they would like their subjects to be transparent. And it always goes this way. There's no reason it shouldn't go this way. And if you were in power and you had all the special privilege, of course you would want your secrecy, right? And I think that one of the things you have to understand is that it's not that they're evil. It's not that they're some scheming conspiracy. It's just rational. If I'm George Bush and I want to push through a bunch of things, I'm going to try to do it as secretly as possible and put in bills that are, it, it, it's just a normal thing. And so we have to think about how do you hack a system which natural tendency is towards more power aggregation and more secrecy and transparency for those who don't have power. One of my friends is a Chinese guy and his dad told me, money is lonely. It likes to go where other money is. And it's the same with power. It's just like a law of physics. It doesn't have ethics. It's just the way it is. And I think this is something you have to think about because what the information age and the internet and all these other things is doing is it's increasing the ability and lowering the friction for power aggregation. It doesn't change the fundamental dynamics that have been around for a long time. This is a strong statement and I feel quite strongly about this. I think that voice is more important than votes. Okay? So back when you didn't have a lot of information and you, you, you would vote and most of the votes were you voted with your family, you voted with your company, but you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in California is like a vote button on your TV. It doesn't matter that people got to vote if they don't have any information, right? The whole point is that if you win the argument in public, in the media, when America went to war with Iraq, more than half of the Americans thought that 9-11 terrorism was caused by Iraq. Now, so it doesn't matter that they can vote if they don't know the truth, right? And so I think that's what's really important right now is to provide everyone with a voice. And the other thing about voice, this is something that I find on blogs, is that people start writing on my blog and it's like when you're in class, if you're sitting and you're listening and you know somebody's gonna call on you, you listen harder. Or if you know you have to explain this book that you're reading to somebody else, you read it more carefully. And giving people voice also switches on their brain, right? And I think that this is important, just, not just in developed nations, but also in developing nations. And to me, and I'll give you another example, I can board. You think that voting is really important? Well, everybody votes the way that they're convinced by the non-voting liaisons, right? So if the guy from IETF is sitting on the board, 
John Clanson, he gives an eloquent speech about why this is too risky or that's too risky. Well, everybody votes that way, right? The, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank always votes with the majority. Voting is a process, and yes, it is important for break, and you go talk to the Wikipedia guys. Voting is a last choice. It's only when there's no other choice. Whenever they can, they try to reach consensus. And with the internet and with a lot of these new tools that we have, we can try to reach consensus more and more. So I think that the key is to provide voice. And in the same way, you know, I know you have a lot of hate speech issues. People have a lot of hate speech issues. I would much rather argue with those people who have hate speech and beat them up in public than to censor them. Because when you start censoring them, it gives them an excuse. You know, putting Il Al Manara, the, uh, the Hezbollah channel, on the terrorist list by the United States, this is the stupidest thing you can do because now they have an excuse. Another thing, I'm going to talk about privacy for a second because I think that a lot of people think that privacy is about some kind of personal vulnerability. I don't want people to know I read all this porn, or I don't want people to know this, I don't want people to know that. That's not the primary risk of privacy. The primary risk of privacy is a systemic profiling that can cause a chilling effect and cause behavior change. And so what I mean by profiling is I'll use some Japanese examples. I'm sure there's some examples in Germany. There's a left-wing newspaper called Akahata. And if you are a subscriber of the left-wing newspaper, they have, you're on a list. And you can't get a job in a big public company and you can never be promoted above certain ranks in certain companies. If your father was an Akahata subscriber, you can never become a public prosecutor or a judge. Okay? And they sometimes do this for grandchildren. And so this list goes around, it's a common practice. Same thing if you're, your arrest record, even if you weren't convicted or tried or charged, if you're arrested, you are on the arrest list. And so when somebody's trying to hire you or you're, somebody's trying to marry you, they get this thing that says, oh, well, this guy's been arrested. And if you think about it from the pers perspective of somebody who's profiling, it makes total sense. Statistically speaking, people who have been arrested are probably more likely to be arrested again than people who aren't. Statistically speaking, people who subscribe to the left-wing newspaper are probably more likely to blow something up than if they're not. And the thing about profiling, which is really important, again, I'll get back to this point, it's not about being evil or anything like that. It's if I can have as much information as possible, what would I do to make it statistically better for my organization when I'm hiring people, when I'm letting people into my country, when I have to beat the shit out of somebody? What do I look at to make this a fact? And so now you think about, okay, well, if the United States government came to the Japanese government and said, okay, we, we are going on high terror alert, we want the list of likely to be terrorist Japanese. And so this would mean that people who have hung out with these groups, people who have gone to school with these people, people who spend more money on this kind of thing, people who rent this kind of movie, and, and then you create a profile and they would put, uh, make a list and they would not let them in the United States. And maybe they would arrest the top 100 of them or something. But for them, if they can catch one bad guy and maybe piss off a million Japanese, maybe that makes sense. And it's the cost of false positives. It's also a lot cheaper when they're not your own countrymen. But the thing that's really risky here is if you think about it, for instance, Donatella who spoke here uh, last year about Arab media, well, I don't want her sending me SMSs anymore. You know? It's, I don't, you know, I have to be careful about what I say. Maybe next year I have to worry about coming to this conference because every single little thing that I do that Maybe this will start, they will start harassing me going into the United States. Maybe this will hurt my children's ability to get into good school. And this chilling effect on what you say and what you do damages this whole concept of competition of ideas, the ability to speak freely, the ability to behave freely, and the ability to be the, the hacking open thing. And, and I think that that cost, you know, I don't, a lot of people say I don't need privacy because I don't do anything bad. You know, maybe none of the people here say that, but, but the thing is that that's a stupid excuse because what if you come up on something that you find out, you're a whistleblower, or you find some fact that needs to go out that will get you on some list, these profiles will prevent you from trying to do that. Um, the other argument that I hear a lot, of, well, all the information's on Google. Well, no, that, it's not categorized in the same way. So the Department of Homeland Security is making a schema for profiling to make it easier, okay? These are the kinds of architectural things that are dangerous, national ID systems, things like that. Because, for instance, the two biggest banks in Japan merged. They spent over $5 billion trying to merge their accounts, and they turned it on and it didn't work. They couldn't merge two big 
big databases. It's really, really expensive and really, really hard. So for me to go on to Google and make a list of 100,000 most dangerous people according to this profile is very hard. It's easy to go and investigate an individual, but it's very hard to make a profile. And so what you have to be careful about is that we don't want it to be so easy that somebody with a laptop computer in Excel can create a profile in some little village and start harassing people and doing witch hunts and things like that. These are the kinds of things that are dangerous. And so to me, messy information on Google is not nearly as dangerous as the information you don't know about that's being collected through um, systemic uh, systems. And one last thing is, there's, I know there's a session on the EU Data Privacy Act. This is something you really need to think about because a lot of the core principles of the EU Data Privacy Act were back in the mainframe days when the data was just sitting there in this hard disk and there were no copies anywhere. So you can say, you have control of your data, you can erase it. Well now, the minute you create some data, it's everywhere. It's never gone. It's like pollution, it's like radiation. So it's more about the freedom not to create information, not the freedom to control the information that is created. And so I think you really need to think about it. And this is where the hackers come in because the people who are passionate about privacy often don't have any computers, they don't understand how the network works, and the laws are written in really stupid ways. Um, the other thing is ID systems. I'm not going to preach here because I think people mostly agree with me, but a lot of people want to make these ID, national ID systems and things like that. I would really want everyone to argue against this. I don't, I've never seen any data that shows that ID systems prevent I'm Every single criminal I know, and I know many, <laughs> has a fake ID. Duh. And they also talk about profiling and going on airplanes. Well, I think Bruce Schneier wrote about this. Well, if I am a terrorist, first of all, I have a fake ID. The second thing is I would go on the plane once without a bomb. If I don't get flagged, I try it again. When I'm comfortable that my profile is not matched and my ID is good, then I carry a bomb, right? This is much more secure from the terrorist perspective than the old days where they kind of like checked you out and you weren't sure what kind of guy you were going to get. It's this kind of systemic profiling and IDs that I think that law enforcement gets kind of, they get excited about these technologies because it sounds good. But the problem is, for fake IDs, the weakest link is the guy who issues you the ID, and if they are a bribable person, and almost just about anyone is bribable, you can make a fake ID. It's a weak link. And the problem is you get these smart cards and biometrics and blah, 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 and everybody starts to feel really secure. But what it happens is they build all this stuff around it, and they just make a very secure network for people who spoof IDs. And so you really have to be careful who is your target, and what happens is that more and more the average citizen is losing their privacy, is losing the ability. Think about it too. I mean, back when your ID was like a kind of a piece of crap, if somebody stole your ID, they couldn't do that much with it. But now, if you've got all this stuff built around your ID and somebody steals it, it's really, really hard to get back because people trust it. And that's really the important thing is I don't want people to trust these ID systems. And a lot of it is just run by companies who want to make money making these IDs. Um, anonymity, this I think people probably agree, but I would just say it very strongly, is I actually sat in the airplane with the head legal guy from the FBI and had a long 15-hour conversation about this. And he kept arguing that because of things like who is and these databases, he was able to actually save some woman who was kidnapped because they could trace the email and they saved the woman's life. And because of that, he argued that it's good that we can trace people. But for every woman in Florida that gets saved because she's kidnapped, you know, hundreds of people in Zimbabwe and Iran are being killed. And if we think about developing nations and we think about the f ability to speak without fear of retribution, anonymity is essential. And it has a lot of costs and people will argue all kinds of things, but I think we really need to protect it. One other thing is you're all hackers. I bet everyone here knows how to be anonymous no matter what kind of technology they make. You can, right now, you can spoof your MAC address, you can do whatever you want. So anyone who has enough money can be anonymous anyway. It's like my ID thing. And so what you're going to get is going to get the lame people who don't know how to be anonymous, the average citizens who are fighting for their human rights, but you won't get the professional terrorists and the professional criminals. They will always be anonymous. And so that's the other thing is it actually doesn't really work, it, technically. That's a hard argument to make. Um, I was arguing with an American senator the other day, and to him, he just was said, no. That does, he pointed, shook his finger at me, and he said, the days of the lawless internet are over. And he was really passionate about it. And 
and I found out he doesn't even have a computer. So, um, but he was serious, and the problem was he's getting lobbied by Hollywood, he's getting lobbied by law enforcement, he's getting lobbied by you know, everybody who says that anonymity is a problem. If you solve the anonymity problem and force people to have licenses to use the internet, we'll all be safe. And everything points to that, so it's something that's being um, chopped away at. Um, I don't know if you know the word boogeyman. It's kind of an English weird colloquial word, but it's kind of the scary monster that the parents use to scare the kids into behaving. It's like, beware the boogeyman. And so what all of these guys do is they have their little boogeyman. So Hollywood and the big software guys always talk about, well, sharing is stealing. And if you steal, that's bad for the economy. We can't make business. And in fact, Hollywood said that software pirates feed terrorism. It gets all linked together. But this is one of the big boogeymen. So when you talk about open source and sharing, they'll always make you look like you're anti-business or you're anti or you're a terrorist or something like that. The other boogeyman is that terrorists and child pornographers use the internet. This was a big one. Um, over in March 11th, we had a conference at Madrid. It was one year anniversary of the terrorist attack. And Kofi Annan and everyone was there. But this is like a big theme. People really think that if they shut down the internet, terrorism and child pornography will go away. And I think that the problem is that you get, when you, like a politician gets up and says, well, we, we want this. They say, so you must be for child pornography. Or you must be pro-terrorism. And it's kind of this rhetoric that's very difficult but this is what you will already you are, are encountering or will be encountering. The other stupid idea is the idea of the intelligent network. A telephone company say, oh, well, you can't do voice over IP. We need quality of service. Or you're going to get so much, the children will be, ex be exposed to all this terrible content. But all kinds of the network guys are lobbying to try to f make it sound like we need an intelligent network, when in fact we just need them to push the bits. And they just want to make some money back. This is the other bad idea. <clears throat> So let me talk a little bit about, without it just pointing out the problems, some of what we can do. And again, in Rupp and Frank's talk, they have a lot of what we can do, which I think is really important. And I'd like everyone to think about what we can do when they listen to people's talks. And one of the important things is that copyright and a lot of um, digital rights management things are hampering the ability for people to share content. And one of the key elements of free speech is ability to transmit and have discussions and things like that. The big problem is the, a lot of constitutions in a lot of countries protect the press. Because back in the old days, presses were people like individuals who printed things like Thomas Paine. They were more like bloggers. But now they're multinational corporations that really don't need protecting. But one of the things that they use is they use copyright because they treat all content as if it were some commercial product. So one example is uh, Greenwald, who's a documentary producer, wanted to get video clips of George Bush for his documentary to do a critique. And NBC, I think it was, said, oh, we can't, it's copyrighted content. You know, and the problem is text. We have a long history of using text for uh, doing free speech and having discussion. In most countries, text is fairly protected in terms of the ability to have some kind of fair use. But video, for instance, is very difficult. And if you look at all the cool movies, the political messages on the internet these days with video, video is a really important part of the message. Podcasting is an important part of the message. You can't even sample a sliver of a song, at least in America right now. And so one of the things we need to think about is how can we create Creative Commons? We, I talked about last year is one idea to make your content more open, uh, licenses. Um, I don't have it on here. I have it on a different slide, but Wikipedia is another example. Blog is another example. But I'm not going into detail here, but the, the copyright is one of the things that's holding back free speech, and we need to remember. Um, we need to keep the network open, and we need to keep the network one. And anyone who's an anti-ICANN guy, I can, we can have it out in the hall later, but I will say that there are many things that ICANN needs to improve, but it's, and it is somewhat unilateral because of a momentum that they have from the United States. But there are only a few Americans on the board. Eight of the 15 are independently elected through this a fairly open process, open enough for somebody like me to get in, right? Um, I can say whatever I want. Um, and anyone can show up, take the public mic, and speak. And there has to be a response. And it still has many problems. But if you compare it to the ITU, 
or there's a session later on the WSIS process. If you look at the process that the governments use, where it's one country, one vote, it's a lot of it is about diplomacy, and these votes are often captured by telephone monopolies, go to an ITU meeting and try to decide whether you would rather have these guys running it or not before you decide not to try to fix ICANN. ICANN, I think, is fixable, and it requires participation. And the other thing I would say, because I know Andy was on the board and other things, it's changing. It's changing a lot, and if you participated several years ago, try again, because the problem right now is they're trying to take control of the internet away from the bottom-up process into a top-down process. And ICANN has its problems, but it's still at least focused on trying to create a consensus process. That's my pitch for ICANN. Um, the other, just I just tacked it on here, but free spectrum, this is another area that a lot of people talk about, but something that is really, really important, and it's a, much, a very local thing as well. Um, I don't know if you saw, like in Philadelphia, the city tried to do a municipal Wi-Fi network, and I think it was um, one of the telephone companies came and sued them. Um, eventually, the telephone company lost. But first, it's the normal junk ban that we're given right now, which is crap anyway. But eventually, what we want is we want the television networks and the telephone networks to give back the spectrum. And this is something that's quite political, but really, really important for creating an open network that's not controlled by television com companies and telephone companies. <clears throat> and I think supporting open source and um, free software and sharing um, this is, again, something that you have to think about in a daily way. And what's important here, I think, is that a lot of people seem to think that there's no, that open source can't be business, that it, it, it's stealing money from artists or it's stealing money from people who have spent so much time on their inventions and things like that. Well, there are people who make money from open source. There are ways that, like the French, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but this new bill about taking a tax and then allowing P2P. We need, to part, we need to experiment with some business models and we need to prove that there are other ways to do innovation other than the old idea of only innovation. Because if you look at intellectual property law, the idea is that innovation can only happen inside of big companies and that it's protected by um, intellectual property and that software patents and things like this prevent people from stealing ideas. Well, if you look at the open internet, Almost all of the good ideas started outside of the big companies. And even the big companies, the smart ones like IBM, are giving up their intellectual property. And so this whole idea of sharing is bad for business, or sharing steals jobs, or sharing steals value, we need to show that this isn't true and make it more than just a political movement. That's why I'm doing a lot of work in the business side, because I want to convince the corporate executives that, no, we're not here to be just anarchists. Well, not all of us but that we're actually trying to contribute to society that's going to flourish. And I think that you know, we, we have to have good examples for this. Um, global voices is really important. And I think that people always say, oh, there's digital divide, blah, 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 blah. Well, even if there's digital divide, you can have intermediaries. You can have people who go, like Witness, that creates documentaries with these people, people who write blogs from these countries, and amplifying the voice and helping people who translate. Creative Commons is one good way because it allows people to translate without asking for permission. But we really need to make this a global network because our problems are global and it's really, really interesting what some of these people have to say in developing countries. And also, I mean, they're not developing countries really, but in Europe you have this whole communication with Eastern Europe that still needs to happen. And I think that a lot of this amplification is important. One really important thing, and this is kind of in response to the uh, article from uh, Frank, I think many people have an overestimation of the power of these um, conspiracies. I've given talks at the Trilateral Commission, which is considered supposed to be a really scary place. It's not. It's just a bunch of really powerful people who sit around, and they talk like normal people and make decisions like normal people. It's the same at Davos. It's the same in these big com com country bureaucracies. Actually, it's more like the movie Brazil than it is like 1984. And the thing is that there is a natural inertia for things to happen. Like I tried to stop the privacy, um, I tried to stop the national ID bill in Japan, and I got 80% of the public, all the media, more than half the politicians, to vote okay for my um, moratorium until the privacy bill was passed. And it went through anyway, and I tried to find who was the guy who pushed it through and everything, and I finally talked to one of the politicians and said, oh, it just went through because it would have been too confusing and disruptive if we stopped it, even though we all agreed it was a bad idea. And this is what I mean by a broken democracy, and this is what I mean that there really isn't a conspiracy. There was no person, that was why it was difficult, there was no person who was out to do the national ID. 
it just became a $300, $600 million project that just started rolling along, and you couldn't stop it. It's like a tanker with the driver dead over the wheel. That's what we're fighting against. And we're fighting against momentum. We're not fighting against really smart people with lots of information. And actually, we're smarter than them, which is another thing that's important. We're, we have less power, but we're smarter, and we can coordinate better. And I can say anything here because I doubt any of them will be watching this video. And I think that really, I would like everyone to have the guts right now to question authority and hack the system. I'm in a lot of these places, and they need this kind of input from the outside. They need conferences like this. They can point at and say, look at all these smart people are saying this. They need people to argue with them. And it's really not the right time to roll over and give up. As, as Tim said, be furious, be serious, be angry. You know, fight for things, and you'll get them. And I think that you do need there's a lot of tutorials during this week on how to be tactical, how to hack the system, but really it's the time, it, the time isn't to sit around and give up. The time is really, to, and, and really the point is to, to question authority because a lot of the smart people who have authority, at least the good ones, are questioning themselves as well. And so they, like, they would like to hear, not all of them, but some of them would like to hear. So anyway, I, I'm going to try to stop now in case I have time to... Uh, get some discussion and allow people to have their free speech. Uh, thank you. Is, should I, Tim, should I take questions or? Should I take some? Okay, comments. And comments are fine as well. Uh, I've got uh, well, one question relating to the, uh, what would you say, watch lists like in Japan. Well, what do you think will be the effect of terrorism of imprisoning people that are not terrorists yet? Yes. Uh, uh, on the growth of terrorism. <laughs> um, you mean like the minority report stuff, right? Um, well, I, I think that already they imprison a lot of people who they think have information. Um, and in Japan, it's very common practice to actually question a lot of people and harass people who have information even if they're not involved. I, I think that the practice in the United States is, is ramping up, and I think we need to fight it. Um, I don't have a really good response other than that it's happening already. And we need, to, we need to fight it. And, and that's my fear, is to end up on a list and be questioned. OK. I guess everybody's leaving, Tim. Should I switch with the next speaker? All right, thank you.